بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس ان آر پریویس لیکچر وی اسٹارٹیڈ ڈسکسنگ پروفٹس اینڈ ایز یو نو ود دی بیک گراؤنڈ آن دی تھیری آف دا فرم پروفٹ میکسمائزیشن واز واٹ انٹرسٹیڈ اس آل الانگ بٹ وی اسٹارٹیڈ ڈسکشن آن پروفٹس یسٹر ڈے اینڈ بلیو یو می وی ول کمپلیٹ دیٹ ڈسکشن ٹو ڈے ان فیکٹ بفور دا فرسٹ ہاف آف دس لیکچر نا سم آف یو مائٹ بی ونڈرنگ all this effort for profit maximization and then finishing profit maximization in less than a lecture and a half does that make sense well the argument is that as we have gone along that is we first discussed costs then we discussed revenues then we understood what profits meant as we went along the task that we had to do later on became easier because we had spent a lot of time clarifying our concepts about costs and revenues and other things and when we discussed profits we already knew about the different shapes of the curves we knew about elasticity we knew about the definitional issues that arise in economics and therefore profit maximization became as easy as it could possibly be so this is the good thing about economics that all of you should be happy about that as you go along as you move further and further given that you've covered the difficult stuff at the start things become simpler and you will notice the advantage when you study macroeconomics with me once you've done microeconomics macroeconomics will become much more easy because you've already developed an understanding of demand curves and supply curves so when the individual curves are aggregated at the macro level they'll be much easier to understand now in order to start today's lecture let me talk a little bit about what i was discussing at the end of the last lecture and that was some qualifications about the way in which firms maximize their profits note that the first two qualifications that we looked at was that we were talking mainly in the context of the short run and that in the long run we would simply have profit maximized at the point where the marginal revenue curve intersects the long run marginal cost curve the second qualification was that what is the point at which the firm would minimize its losses if the firm found itself in an unfortunate situation that is in a situation where the average revenue curve was always below the average cost curve that is it if it was not possible for the firm to make a profit and then we saw that the principle that uh, the marginal cost curve intersects the marginal revenue curve and that point produces the profit maximizing output well in the case when the firm is making losses the same principle still applies and that point is still the optimal point of production for the firm because it will now minimize losses those were the two qualifications we discussed in our previous lecture let's now discuss the remaining two now the first qualification that i want to talk about is when the marginal curve and the marginal cost and the marginal revenue curves intersect at more than one point so far we have been talking about the intersection point as if it is not possible to have more than one intersection point that is there is only one possible output level at which marginal cost equals marginal revenue but this is just the way we've drawn our curves it is in fact possible that marginal revenue and marginal cost curves intersect at two points and not one so what are the implications for our choice of the profit maximizing output well it has pretty serious implications if you have two possible candidates for q star that is the optimal level at which the firm should produce then you need to decide which one of those two outputs to choose in order to understand which one of those two output levels the firm would choose we need to look at some graphs and develop an intuition regarding what happens 
when the marginal cost and marginal revenue curves intersect at more than one point. Let's look at our first graph for today. Now as you can see my friends, we have drawn a typical marginal revenue curve that is a downward sloping marginal revenue curve and we've drawn a typical U-shaped marginal cost curve. The only difference from our earlier drawings is that we have extended the left arm of the U of the marginal cost curve which we earlier did not used to extend so much. And once we've extended it, we've seen that the curve intersects the marginal revenue curve at a point Q1. Okay? Now, you have two candidates here where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. And as such, it is possible, theoretically, to say that both points would maximize profits. But this is not true. When you are at point Q1, if you want to move to the right, you will notice that marginal revenue will become greater than marginal cost. And therefore, it makes sense to move further to the right. Now, as you hit point Q2, that is the point at which output Q2 intersects the marginal cost and marginal revenue curves, that point, you cannot now increase your profits any further. And this indeed is the topmost point of the hill that I had talked about in the previous lecture. So the rule for profit maximization can then be redefined as follows. The rule is that the firm should produce at the point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, provided that above that output, marginal cost exceeds marginal revenue and below that output, marginal revenue exceeds marginal cost. And this will ensure that in the graph that we have at our hands, the firm will produce at Q2 and not Q1. Now the last point within this uh, qualifications segment of the lecture that I want to talk about is that which relates to the shutdown point for the firm. That is there a point at which the firm will shut down or will decide to close its operations in the short run? What will that point be? Now, if you recall our earlier discussion on costs, you will remember that we identified two types of costs. We noted that there were fixed costs, that had to be incurred whether the output uh, was produced or not. And there were variable costs which increased with the level of output or the level of activity of the firm. Now, in the short run, if the firm faces a situation where the price that it is getting for its output or the average revenue that it is earning is greater than the average variable cost, that is the variable or unit cost that it incurs for producing each unit, it might still continue to produce because it might feel that it is covering some of its fixed costs which would otherwise not be covered if it did not produce. So if the firm is hopeful that in the long run or in the next period things would improve and that the price will rise or the average variable cost or the average cost will fall so that the firm can make normal profits, then it might decide to continue operating in the short run. However, if the firm finds that its average revenue or the price that it is getting for each unit of its product falls below the average variable cost, that is the variable cost or the unit cost of producing a particular uh, good, then it will not produce. That is, that point at which the average revenue curve intersects, the average variable cost curve will be the shutdown point. Let's illustrate this through a graph. Now, as you can see in this graph, we've drawn three curves. We've drawn the average cost curve, which is typically shaped the way we've drawn it earlier. We've drawn the average variable cost curve, which if you remember, 
we also drew exactly like this that is the gap between the average cost and average variable cost curves narrows as we increase out output and then we've drawn the average revenue curve which is obviously the downward sloping demand curve that we have for a price making firm now if the firm hits the point uh, q that is the point at which the average revenue curve intersects the average variable cost curve the firm will realize that it is not making any profit or it is not making any money to cover its fixed costs and you know some of these fixed costs can be rent or uh, it could be depreciation of the plant due to age it could be the costs of foremen or the costs of drivers or the costs of the of maintaining the head office all these costs would not be covered if the firm was not getting a price which was higher than the average variable cost and therefore this point would be characterized as the shutdown point for the firm now the key point to remember there is that it is possible for for the firm to operate at a level where its average revenue is below its average cost that is it is possible for a firm to operate when it is making losses it might be the optimal decision because if the firm feels that the situation is going to change in the near future then it might want to persist with producing because that helps the firm cover some of the fixed costs that the firm is incurring however if the average revenue or the price is below the average variable cost then there will be no point in producing because with each extra unit you produce you incur a loss a variable loss that is not a loss which is related to the fixed costs but this is a loss which you make on each additional unit and therefore the shutdown point is that point where the average revenue curve intersects the average variable cost curve now note another point here that when you are in the long run you do not have any fixed costs so the only costs that you are concerned with are the long run average costs so what would be the shutdown point for a firm in the long run think about it yes the point of intersection or the point of tangency between the average revenue curve and the long run average cost curve that will be the shutdown point for a price making firm in the long run now my friends with that discussion concluded on the qualifications about uh, profit maximization uh, let's move to how we can maximize profits using calculus now calculus was invented in the 17th century i presume by some people say it was um, isaac newton other people have uh, different inventors in mind but the one thing that they are all sure of is that nobody ever thought that calculus would be used so much in economics of all subjects economics was considered a social science but now with the increasing use of calculus in economics it's become very mathematics intensive and the use of calculus is really very pervasive in economics at the postgraduate and graduate levels so here also i'd like to illustrate how a firm can make its profit maximization decision based on its use of calculus let's illustrate through a slide now imagine that a firm's total revenue and total cost functions can be written as follows tr is equal to 48 q minus q squared and tc that is total cost is equal to 12 plus 16 q plus 3 q squared note that the tr function would plot as a concave function whereas the tc function would plot as an upward sloping curve note also that the term 12 here in the tc function stands for fixed costs that is when q is equal to 0 some fixed costs would still be incurred now from these two equations 
we can derive the following table. We have quantity in the first column, total revenues in the second column, total costs in the third column, and total profits, which is basically equal to TR minus TC in the last column. Now, as we plug the different quantities in the TR and TC functions, we can fill the table up. And as we've seen here, we, we, we obtain different values. And then we can subtract TC from TR to get total profits. Now, from the table, it is clear that profit is maximized at a quantity of 4. That is, when the quantity produced is 4 units, total profit is 52 rupees or whatever units of money and that profit cannot be exceeded at any other level of output. The great thing about calculus is that it allows us to obtain this profit maximization or profit maximizing output without needing to draw up a table like this. And sometimes when we have very complicated revenue and cost functions, it might be very simple to use calculus. Now, how can this be obtained? The key to this is again going back to our principle that marginal revenue should equal marginal cost at the point where profit is maximized. Now, how can you derive the marginal revenue function from the TR function there? If you remember, the marginal revenue function is simply the slope of the TR function. That is the rate of change of total revenue delta TR over delta MR or delta Q. Therefore, the marginal revenue function is DTR over DQ in the limit. Now, similarly, the marginal cost function can be found by differentiating the total cost function. If that is, marginal cost is equal to DTC over DQ. Differentiating the cost functions that we have here, we get the marginal revenue function as 48 minus 2Q and the marginal cost function as 16 plus 6Q. The profit will be maximized where MR is equal to MC. So we simply equate the two functions that we have obtained. And when we solve for Q, we get Q is equal to 4. And when we put this Q in the total revenue and the total cost functions and subtract the latter from the former, we get exactly 52. So this is the algebraic way of solving for the profit maximizing output and the maximum profit using calculus. The other important point to note from this graph is that if you get the average revenue function from the total revenue function, you will get 48 minus Q. And if you compare that with the marginal revenue function, you will notice that the two are identical except that the marginal revenue function has twice the slope that than the average revenue function. The average revenue function has a slope of minus 1, whereas the marginal revenue function has a slope of minus 2. And this is standard for most of the cases that we will study that the marginal revenue function will be drawn as a steeper line than the average revenue function. We've been drawing it so far, but without explaining why. Calculus gives us the answer as to why the marginal revenue function is more steeply sloped than the average revenue function. And it also tells us that the steepness is twice that of the average revenue curve. So my friends, with that, we conclude our discussion of profit maximization, at least the rudiments of profit maximization. Now the question is, is the problem that the firm has been solved? Well, the problem has been solved to the extent that we now know how the firm will uh, achieve its profit maximizing output or how it will decide what output to produce that will maximize its profits and then how that profit will be calculated. However, there are four questions that still interest us and that we still have not been able to answer. What are those four questions? The first question is, we don't know what determines whether a firm will make a big profit 
or a small profit, right? We have not yet discussed that. All we have said is that when the firm uh, operates at its profit maximizing output, this is the profit that the firm will make. And this here will be equal to the difference between the average revenue and the average cost multiplied by the quantity produced. But we have not seen how or what determines how much profit the firm will make. Are there certain firms which make larger profits and certain firms which make less profits? Well, yes. If we look around us, we see that some firms uh, run into losses, other firms are doing very well. We have newspaper headlines about which firms, is, which firms are doing well and which, which sectors are suffering and all these things. So we need to develop some understanding of what are the determinants of the profits or the size of profits that firms make. The second important question is that what is the quantity at which firms will produce? What we said was that yes, firms should produce at that level where the marginal cost and the marginal revenue curves intersect. But we have not seen what this point of intersection or where this point of intersection will be for different firms and why it will be at different places for different firms. So we are working with a, a, a hypothetical firm and we say that well this particular firm has a marginal revenue curve going down like this and a marginal cost curve going like this and this is the point of intersection. But we don't know what that point of intersection will be or where that point of intersection will be for a different firm. There could be any number of points of intersection for any number of firms. So we need to understand at what level of output will different firms have their different points of intersection of marginal cost and marginal revenue. That's the second question. The third question is that the price or the quantity at which the firm is producing, will that level of operations also be efficient from a production sense or a production point of view? Or is there some other higher or lower level of production where the firm uh, should produce in order to achieve productive efficiency? All we have talked about is that that level of output at which marginal revenues are equal to marginal costs is the profit maximizing output. But we have not talked about production or productive efficiency. That is, whether that level of output also maximizes the efficiency of the firm, the efficiency of the plant that the firm is running. We have not talked about that. So that is an important question to think about as well. The fourth question, which concerns everybody uh, of us, because all of us are consumers, is that when firms are price makers, that is when they have a role in determining prices, then the prices that they set or the prices that are determined by their supply decisions, are those prices too high for consumers, too low for consumers or just right? We have not answered that question either. So that question again, like the first three questions, is critically important if we want to understand whether and why firms profit maximizing levels are good for society, what the nature of the profit maximization level is, and whether there is room for improvement. Now in order to answer those four questions, let us develop our understanding of market structures. Now let me explain to you what I mean by the term market structure. Now as you know, any firm, any particular firm operates in a certain market environment. It operates in a certain industry. There are other players in the industry as well, other producers. And a market structure basically refers to how this industry or this market that the firm is operating in is structured. And the market structure is a critical uh, criteria or critical feature which determines how the nature of profit maximization will change from firm to firm. So one firm which operates in a different market structure will answer those four questions differently. Another firm which operates in a different market, market structure will have different answers to those four questions. 
Now, what are the key ingredients of any market structure? They are essentially four, or at least I will simplify it to four. The first relates to the number of firms in the market or the number of firms operating in the industry. That number can be very large, that can be as small as one. So that's one. Then there could be restrictions to entry of new firms. That's the second feature. That are there any barriers to entry or is entry of other firms free? Can more firms come into the same business? Okay, so that's the second one. The third one is the nature of the product. Are all the firms producing the same kind of product or are they producing different kinds of products? So are the products homogenous or are they heterogeneous, that is different? And the fourth question is the control that firms have over price, whether they exercise a lot of control or whether they in their individual capacities have no control at all. Remember that we discussed that when there are a large number of firms in their individual capacities, they have no control over the price that prevails in the market. Whereas if there is just one producer or a few producers, then those few producers will exercise a lot of control over the market price. So these are the four features of any market structure. Number of firms, the barriers to entry, the nature of the product, and the control over prices. Now if we were to classify these different types of market structures, then we would come up with a whole spectrum. You could have uh, a situation in which there are many firms which have no impact on prices, or you could have a situation in which you have just one firm with control on prices, and you can have a whole range of combinations in the middle. Economists have come up with a fairly simple classification though. They have defined the two polar cases, that is that of perfect competition, in which there are a large number of firms, each firm being a price taker, and we discussed that case earlier on in our discussion of profit maximization. And at the other pole is a monopoly, and I gave the example of WAPDA or KESC, where you just have one firm operating in the entire industry, and that one firm strongly controls the price that it charges. And in the middle, you have things like uh, monopolistic competition, where you still have a large number of firms, but they all have differentiated products. They are selling slightly different products. So there is advertising and brand development and things like that. And then towards monopoly, further out towards monopoly, you have oligopolistic structures, market structures, or cartels, in which you have only a few large players. You don't have one player, you have a few large players, and they do influence uh, the price that prevails in the market. So those four categories, that is the uh, perfect competition case, the monopolistic competition, oligopoly and monopoly. Those are the four different market structures that we will study in this course. We will start by discussing perfect competition, but let me uh, at the outset give you a broad understanding of what the different features are of these four market structures. Let's look at a slide for that. As you can see my friends, we have a matrix here. In the first column, we have the type of market structure, that is perfect competition, monopolistic competition, oligopoly or cartel, or monopoly, that is the case where there is no competition. Then we have the four criterion or the four features that I mentioned, the number of firms, the freedom of entry criterion, the nature of product, and the implications for the demand curve, that is, whether the, the, whether the firm controls prices or whether it receives prices, that is, whether it is a price taker or a price maker. Now, as you can see, for the case of perfect competition, we have a very large number of firms. We have unrestricted uh, freedom of entry, so any number of firms can enter the market 
and similarly firms can leave the market as well then there are uh, homogenous products which are undifferentiated products so there are identical products being produced by all the firms so you can think of the market for grain let's say grain ya gandum uh, is is identical whether one producer is producing or another one is producing or the market for a particular vegetable there is not much differentiation between them but something like coca cola or pepsi um while you might think they are also homogenous but other people might say that they are differentiated by brands but in perfect competition we assume that the products are homogenous then the implication for demand curve as we noticed earlier the perfect competition firm will face a horizontal demand curve that is the firm will be a price taker now in the second row you have monopolistic competition where you can see there are still uh, many and and several uh, firms operating freedom of entry is still unrestricted however the products are differentiated there are different brands being produced the implications for the demand curve are that the demand curve will be downward sloping as we saw in the case of price maker firms uh, but the demand curve will be fairly elastic that is it will not be very steep and this means that the firm can change uh, the market price a little bit but it will have huge implications for its for its total revenue the third uh, row has oligopoly in it and there you see you only have a few uh, number of players freedom of entry is highly restricted uh, you can have a, uh, an oligopoly in which the products are either differentiated or undifferentiated and the examples of such industries would be like the cement industry the motor motor car industry uh, oil is a good example internationally oil or petroleum these are all examples of where uh, oligopolistic structures prevail in terms of the implications for the demand curve we'll again have a downward sloping demand curve but this will now be relatively inelastic that is the uh, firms can change their price but it will not have a very big implication for their total revenues in the last row we have monopoly in which case you just have one firm operating you have restricted or completely blocked uh, freedom of entry that is there will be no firms entering the market there's just one firm the nature of the product is uh, unique in the sense that Uh, the product that is being produced cannot be produced by any other company i mean there is no other company but a good example of this would be uh, wapda that is power generate power generation or power distribution as you know power generation can still be done by a number of firms but power distribution uh, is something that is still being done by just one firm that is wapda in pakistan and then the implications for the demand curve are that the curve will be downward sloping it will be more inelastic than the case for oligopoly that is the firm will have considerable control over prices so my friends with that brief overview of what the different types of market structures are and what their uh, features are and the different examples of industries that fit into those four categories we can now zoom into a discussion on perfect competition that is the first case that we discussed there now there are a number of things that i want to clarify before i move further on this the first thing is when you say perfect competition usually it implies that there is a lot of competition between firms right that there are many firms and there is high degree of competition between them however the number of firms in itself may not necessarily reflect the intensity of competition in a particular industry for example it is possible that a particular industry has 10000 firms operating in it but that 95% of the output or the product produced within that industry is only produced by two or three large players it is possible look at the market for grain internationally for example you have a lot of countries producing wheat gandum right but there are a few very large producers of wheat so there is the united states 
Um, Europe also produces wheat. Then there is India, Pakistan, who are big producers of wheat. So you cannot just tell whether there is strong or intense competition in a particular industry by just looking at the number of firms operating there. You need to see whether the, the firms that are operating are equally sized, whether they have similar output contribution to make to the total uh, output being produced in that industry. That is the key test of whether a high degree of competition exists in a particular market. And for this purpose, economists have suggested the use of concentration ratios. Now, a concentration ratio is simply the percentage of total output that is produced by the largest five firms in a particular industry. So if the largest five firms in any industry produce, let's say, 80% or 70% of the total output of that industry, then you would say that there is not very much competition in this industry. That is, there are only four or five firms. So this cannot be categorized as perfect competition. However, you might have a situation in which the top five firms uh, produce only 20%. That is, in all, there might only be 30 or 40 firms, but they all share about 2% or 2.5% of the total uh, output being produced in that industry. So although the total size or number of firms is not very large, there is still a high degree of competition because all the firms are similarly sized and they're producing roughly similar levels of output. So keep this think about concentration ratios in mind and how it can help you better assess the level of competition in a particular industry. The other thing that I want to clarify is uh, I want to explain to you what the term perfect means in perfect competition. Now, when I was taught economics, I was not explained why we call perfect competition perfect competition. Why don't we call it high competition? or very high competition. Now, there are two or three ways in which one can answer this question. One can say, well, perfect, does, what does perfect mean? I mean, for example, if you have uh, a poison, a particular poison, zehar, koi banata hai, or that zehar is so effective that it will kill everybody who, uh, who is exposed to that poison. Or let's say there is a a particular bomb that is manufactured and that bomb is so powerful that it will uh, destroy the whole planet. Now you can use the terms perfect with those two things as well. You can say that poison is perfect. It can do the job perfectly. And you can say that bomb is a perfect bomb. It can destroy the uh, earth two or three times over. But that does not mean that the underlying thing is good. That is, whether the poison is good or the bomb is good. You're not saying that. Similarly, for perfect competition, when you say, uh, when you use the term perfect competition, you are not saying that competition in itself is good or bad. Right? All you are saying is that this particular characterization of perfect competition is one in which competition is taken at its extreme level. You understand? Just as the poison was made very effective or the bomb was made very powerful to the extent that you started calling it the perfect poison or the perfect bomb, you can say uh, that when the competition level in a particular industry gets very high, you call it perfect competition. This is the highest level of competition that there can be. But you are not passing a normative statement as to whether competition in itself is a good thing or a bad thing for society. And this is a matter of, uh, of debate which, which is still continuing. The other important thing to note is that perfect competition to an economist represents an extreme form of capitalism. That is, all the firms are fully subject to market forces. The firms have no bargaining or influencing power in themselves. Together they form the market and together the market determines the price and neither firms in their individual capacity have the ability to influence that price. Now some people get very confused here because all around us we 
hear funny things being said about capitalism. Capitalism is bad. We have these large firms. Sometimes we talk about foreign firms who come and who take over local businesses and they exploit customers and they, are, uh, they deal with corrupt governments and all sorts of things. And we sort of relate those things with perfect competition or a capitalist economy. But when you give this interpretation of a capitalist economy, that is, a capitalist economy is one in which there is perfect competition and that any individual firm does not have enough bargaining power, then is there a contradiction between these two ideas? So that means, does the perfect competition definition of capitalism contradict with these large, exploitative, multinational corporation type of definitions um, that are given for capitalism? Well, there possibly is. The important thing to note is that there is probably a misconception on the side of consumers. Consumers think that these large multinational corporations or even large firms which uh, dominate the local uh, markets and who charge high prices sometimes, these represent the forces of capitalism, not necessarily. As we've seen, capitalism is best depicted by a state of perfect competition. When you have only a few firms dominating the consumers, that is more a case of oligopoly or a case of monopoly in some cases. That's not a case of perfect competition. However, there is also the, um, the problem of misrepresentation on the firm's side. So all these large firms which are seen as exploiting uh, the people, sometimes they do come or they come forward in the name of capitalism. So they say we are the forces of competition in the world, whereas actually they are not. They are usually uh, firms who would like to see very limited competition. Actually any firm would like to see limited competition in the industry it operates in. And therefore many of these firms while they, f while they say that they are forces of capitalism and forces of competition, they aren't actually. They are actually forces of monopoly and oligopoly. So keep that distinction between capitalism and large exploitative firms separate in your mind and use perfect competition as a benchmark to analyze a capitalist system. The last thing that I want to say about perfect competition is that whether you agree that competition is a good thing or not, and whether perfect competition is indeed a good thing or a bad thing. You can, uh, however, be comfortable with the fact that perfect competition at least provides you with a benchmark to compare some of these other market structures that are existing out there. So perfect competition defines one pole of the different structures that any market can take. We have monopoly at the other end and we have perfect competition at this end. And the existence of these two poles or the identification of these two poles is very important if we are to understand all the intermediate forms of market structures that prevail in the middle. Because in reality we might not have a case of perfect competition around us. But at least the existence of a theoretical notion helps us understand better what must be happening between these two poles and that is critical to economic analysis. Now given that uh, nice background to perfect competition, let's start by focusing on how a firm would maximize its profit in a perfectly competitive market. Let's recap on the assumptions of perfect competition first. Remember that the assumptions were, one, that there are a large number of price-taking firms. Each faces a horizontal demand curve or a horizontal average revenue curve. The second assumption was that there are no barriers to entry. Any number of firms can enter into the business. Now, the implication of this is also that there are no restrictions on the movement of economic factors. That is when, for example, more firms want to come into this business, there should not be any restriction on the laborers who will be hired by those firms which are entering this business. So an underlying assumption of this second assumption is that the factors, the underlying factors, land, capital, not land, capital, 
uh, and labor are mobile. That's an important underlying assumption. The third assumption is about the nature of products. And as we said, that in perfect competition, all the firms are producing an identical or homogeneous product. This is the defining characteristic in terms of the nature of product for perfect competition. So there is no advertising or brand development. We earlier noted that we, we have Coca-Cola and Pepsi. These products would fall in the category of probably oligopoly or imperfect competition, not perfect competition. The final assumption is that consumers and producers have perfect knowledge or perfect information. And I don't think I mentioned this earlier. But this is a very important assumption. We assume that producers have full knowledge about uh, prices, about market opportunities, and about the costs of production. Whereas consumers have full information on prices of products, on their quality, and availability. This is an important fourth assumption of perfect competition. Now, some of these assumptions might seem very restrictive to you. And you might say, well, none of these assumptions hold in reality. You do not have consumers and producers who have perfect information. You do not have uh, unlimited number of firms in any industry. You do not have perfectly mobile uh, economic factors like labor and capital. There are restrictions on all of these things in reality. That's correct. But again, as I mentioned earlier, perfect competition defines one pole of the spectrum of market structures. And therefore, it is important to understand the poles if we are to understand the real situations or the real structures that prevail in the middle. Now, given that recap on assumptions, let's move to an analysis of how equilibrium would be reached in a perfectly competitive industry. Now, the main ingredients of equilibrium analysis, you recall from, uh, from the fourth and fifth lectures, I presume, on equilibrium, was that we need to understand what, what's happening to the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity. We need to know where equilibrium is struck and then how equilibrium changes due to shifts in the demand curve and supply curve, etc., etc. In our analysis of equilibrium in different market structures, what we will be looking at is we look at the price that obtains in equilibrium, we look at the quantity that obtains, the clearing quantity that obtains in equilibrium, and we'll also look at profit because we've now understood how profits are maximized by firms. We will also look at how each individual firm will uh, make its supply curve or will offer to supply goods at different prices. So we look at how short-run supply curves and how long-run industry supply curves can also come out of our equilibrium analysis. Now before we move on, it's important to differentiate between the long-run and short-run. Remember, these two uh, polar positions are again very important. It's very important for you to understand the distinction between long-run and short-run. In the context of perfect competition, the major distinction is this. In the short run, firms, the number of firms is fixed. Firms can't leave or firms, new firms can't join. Firms can leave, yes, when they uh, make uh, revenues which are less than their average variable costs. But generally, new firms can't enter the industry because we are operating in the short run. In the long run, however, there is no restriction on the number of firms that can enter the industry. So remember, when I laid down the assumptions for perfect competition, I was talking about the long-run scenario in which any number of firms can enter the industry. But as you know, in the short run, uh, you do not have that much time to set up a new factory, to set up a new plant. And therefore, the free entry of firms assumption only holds in the long run. When would firms enter a perfectly competitive industry? Think about it. New firms would enter a perfectly competitive industry when the existing firms in that industry are seen to be making supernatural or super normal profits. That is, profits that are in excess of zero or normal profits. 
whereas firms would leave the industry when in the long run they make uh, profits which are less than zero that is when their average revenue is less than their long run average costs so keep that distinction in mind and let's now move into the analysis of short run equilibrium for a perfectly competitive firm let's go to our series of slides for that now as you can see we have price and quantity uh, on the vertical and horizontal axis for the market in the first graph so we have quantity in millions and we have an upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve now as we discussed in our discussion of profit maximization for price taking firms the price that clears the market uh, the price that is determined in the market or the industry will serve as a fixed price for the individual firm so the firm which was which is shown on the right hand side will take the price as given therefore the demand curve or the average revenue and marginal revenue curves will be identical now note the average cost curve which is the typical uh, shape of saucer shaped average cost curve we have the marginal cost curve which intersects the average cost curve at its bottom most point and um, basically we can now analyze whether this particular firm will make profits and in what circumstances will it make losses or super normal profits let's take the first case when the firm makes super normal profit and this is the case that is shown here with the uh, equilibrium point at q star and the firm will make profit of vklt note that the total revenues that the firm will make will be equal to the area ovtq star whereas the total costs that the firm incurs will be equal to oklq star this is very similar to the analysis we did earlier and this will also serve as a good revision exercise for you so the profit that the firm will make which will be categorized here as super normal profit will be represented by the area v k l t now this was the case for super normal profits what happens in the case of normal profits when you have normal profits the average cost curve which is shown here by ac prime will just be tangent to the demand curve or the average revenue curve that is the point at which the average cur cost curve and the demand curve intersect or are tangent to each other and the profit will be zero because both the cost and the revenue are exactly equal and in this case equal to ovtq star note here that the average cost curve already includes the normal profit or the uh, required return on equity for the entrepreneurs that is the owners of the firm now what happens in the last case which is when the average cost curve goes to ac double prime that is further up now the firm will make a loss by operating at q star it can still minimize its loss but the loss that it will make will be equal to uvts that is the difference between costs which are equal to ousq star and the revenues which are equal to ovtq star note that in all of these cases we have kept output constant at the point where mc is equal to mr that is output has not changed from q star note my friends that we still have not talked about the long run equilibrium in this market or the long run equilibrium point for the firm we will do this in our next lecture because we have run out of time for this one so with the end of this lecture we have started our discussion of market structures i hope that you've enjoyed the different menu of structures that i have put before you that is oligopoly imperfect competition and perfect competition and that you are developing some intuition for how firms who are faced with these different market structures maximize their profits and how they make their output and price decisions so till the next lecture it's khuda hafiz and 
السلام علیکم